Please welcome Oliver Parker, Cloud Business Executive for Microsoft. I think I'm actually waiting for a couple of people to come on, but I'll happily start off. So first off, my name is Oliver Parker. I work for Microsoft Corporation. It's a privilege to be able to talk a little bit today about something that I spend my life talking about, which is really around cloud computing and big data. And uh, before we jump in and we'll sort of hear from the panelists, and I'll make an introduction in a second, I just want to frame up a little bit about cloud computing and big data and the relevance with, uh, with healthcare. So, uh, you know, when we think about healthcare, there are really three, three key areas that we focus on. We focus on ubiquitous access to healthcare, improving the quality of healthcare, and bringing down the cost of healthcare. We also need to balance the patient and societal priorities of protecting privacy and ensuring that we are using data responsibly while building a more equitable system that serves the entire population. Our next two speakers that I'll be introducing shortly are at the forefront of that. We're probably all very familiar, bearing in mind we're in the Bay Area with cloud computing and tech data, but it's not immediately uh, evident why those two things come together and the value of healthcare. From a Microsoft standpoint, we're invested very, very deeply in these technologies and bringing them into healthcare. We've recently launched a, uh, um, a service with our research center around diagnosing pneumonia in ICU patients. These kinds of revelations and these innovations in healthcare are all made possible by cloud computing and investments in big data. We've also done genomic sequencing on data sets as it relates to modeling mutations of HIV virus. Again, these kinds of innovations are all made possible by cloud computing and some of the advances in big data. So today I'm joined by two great leaders to talk a little bit more about this. So with that, I'm gonna start making some introductions. First off, I'd like Tarkin Mayner to come up to the stage. Tarkin is chairman and CEO of Nixenter, a global leader in open source software defined storage. I'll let Tarkin tell you a little bit more about that. He's a pioneer in cloud computing and big data industries. He's an investor, an entrepreneur, and an innovator. And Tarkin has held top executive roles at Dell, Weiss, CA Technologies, and Quest. Thanks, Tarkin, for being here. I'm now going to formally introduce Manish Vipani. Manish today joins us from Kaiser Permanente, where he heads up their cloud strategy. Kaiser is one of the largest healthcare providers and an award-winning leader in the area of digital health. In the last eight years with Kaiser, Manish is responsible for setting the direction of Kaiser Permanente's continuing move into the cloud across all its platforms and services. Please welcome Manish. Let me start with you, Manish. In light of your role at Kaiser, maybe you can help the audience and myself understand a little bit more around transforming the patient experience and how that relates to the relationship with doctors and nurses, but also more importantly, how that's changing the care that patients receive. Yes, it's a, healthcare is going through some massive, phenomenal transformation. Um, if I look at uh, our previous CEO, George Halverson, the legacy he left behind was building out our electronic medical record system and digitizing information on tens of millions of patients. Our current CEO, Bernard Tyson, the legacy he's building, the legacy he wants to leave behind is the consumerization of healthcare. And the consumerization of healthcare is very, very interesting. It starts all the way from how you prospect new customers to how you engage somebody that's already a member that might not necessarily come into a Kaiser facility to, to seek care. The millennials, you know, they're in it purely for the insurance play. How do you keep them engaged even when they're not coming in to seek care to ensure that they continue to bring in the revenues and continue to renew into their membership. The patients, more and more, the care is moving to the homes, right? If you look at capabilities like remote diabetes monitoring, I could be sitting at home taking a, gluco taking a glucometer, taking a snippet of my blood, and getting a glucose reading, and before I know, know it, that information is sent to Kaiser Permanente. So the way we are interacting with our patients, the way we are interacting with our consumers, the way we are interacting with our prospects is changing day by day. And to add to that, IoT, you know, the variables and the information that the variables sent to Kaiser Permanente is quite rapidly changing the environment for us. And so for us, more and more of our innovation is moving to the cloud, 
It is bringing innovation to the cloud as opposed to bringing innovative services into the enterprise. And that's a radical change in the way health, how healthcare organizations are interacting with their consumers. That's helpful, thank you. Yeah. So Tarkin, kind a of question for you. How important is it for a company like Nexenter to understand the dynamics and relationships that are so integral to the provision of healthcare? Sure, let me give you a little bit of context background who we are first. Uh, we are a, a, by the way, that a, a Xerox presentation was amazing. A lot of data there. I don't know if you paid attention to the presentation carefully. There was a lot of information, uh, and that's the point. There is a lot of information uh, uh, that we're creating, uh, especially with new uh, innovation around social media, social commerce, uh, mobility. And, and uh, Sophie from Xerox Park talked about IOE, IoT, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything. We are creating so much more data than ever before. Uh, um, uh, we have about six zettabytes of data on Earth. Let me give you a little bit of context so it just doesn't go like this. Kilobytes, we have megabytes, we go gigabytes, we go terabytes, petabytes, exabytes, then we go to zettabytes, and hopefully we're going to go to yottabytes. If we had one disk drive, one zettabyte would be the entire Antarctica. The entire continent of Antarctica would be one zettabyte. One drive would be covering that entire zone. So we have six zettabytes of data on Earth today, and we're managing maybe only 10 to 15% of it in the enterprise. We think we're managing. And that data growth is immense, growing 60, 70, 80% year over year. But the budgets and IT talent and technology talent is not growing at the same pace. I would love to ask Munish how much his budget is growing year over year. His it's CEO is not shrinking. here, he's going to be honest. It's actually shrinking. It's shrinking. Yeah. So there's a big gap. Data is growing. More devices, more systems, more things are connected. Uh, you have kids. They're all connected. Uh, uh, um, our, our cars are connected. We just uh, recently uh, did a, a work with a motor company in Korea, Hyundai. There are 400 sensors in the car, from brake pads to your seat, measuring the heat of your body, temperature. Everything is connected in the car, real time, to a mini server behind the stereo, connected to 17 data centers around the world. Basically, it created almost, uh, um, they're telling us this, almost a, a one petabyte of data in the last uh, four years. This company did not create a one petabyte since they established the company. Uh, right after the World War II. So to give an example, all that data, to manage that data, now into healthcare, you need flexible, cost-effective ways of storage. So we do software-defined storage, meaning a software approach, pure software approach, innovated in the Valley, innovated in the Bay Area, and running on any infrastructure, on any commodity server, disk, and flash, bringing the cost to a level never seen before. Today, you go to an Apple store, you can buy a one terabyte drive from Western Digital for your home, for your pictures, home pictures, will cost you about $19. There's a deal going on in Apple stores right now, 19 bucks, <laughs> which is a huge deal. Used to be about 30 bucks. At the enterprise, Manish and companies like you, you're paying 1000 to $3,000 per terabyte. So there is... A big gap, someone is paying a lot of money to monolithic old school systems. Now everything is becoming software defined, cloud uh, 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 centric, and we provide as a company that software layer for the cloud infrastructure. To companies like Kaiser, to companies like Amazon or Azure. That's helpful and obviously, you know, when we're going back to those three tenants and we think about healthcare, bringing down costs is a significant, is a significant part of that. So just a question to both of you and I'll leave it to either of you who wants to start up. Where do you think we exactly are in the integration of big data and cloud computing with healthcare in terms of realizing some so-called future state? Are we in the dark ages, closer to the industrial revolution, or are we ready to board the Star Trek enterprise? Do you want to get started? Yeah, absolutely. So it's quite fascinating. In the past, when we talked about high-performance, massively parallel processing systems, we looked at appliances very, very expensive appliances. And that's typically how we brought data into these appliances and did all kinds of phenomenal analytics. But with the volume of data increasing so rapidly, that solution is no longer cost effective. So for us, big data is all about ensuring 
that you have a software defined capability that sits across, that sits on top of all of your storage systems, bring that data together through that software defined tier and run analytics on top of it. And within healthcare, I would say we definitely is a little beyond industrial level revolution. We've done some phenomenal things from being able to reduce the length of stay a patient spends at a hospital to finding cures for small diseases to being able to announce to the world that we Kaiser Permanente, if you're a Kaiser Permanente member in Northern California, your chances of getting a heart attack are reduced by 75%, right? So big data enables this for us. And that it's enabled today through software-defined capabilities that Tarkin can talk about as well. So I'll give you a quick anecdote. My, my wife is in medical field. And she's a nurse practitioner at Stanford University. And she always tells me that, don't tell the story publicly, but maybe uh, I hope so you're going against I hope she's not listening to this. So um, she's in the reconstructive surgery unit. And, and uh, as you know, reconstructive surgery is a very big deal. And Stanford Hospital, like Kaiser Permanente, uh, is one of the uh, leading uh, university hospitals on that uh, uh, you know, topic. And like, she's getting all these texts, you know, we have a newborn baby, and like, I'm like, you're on the phone all the time, what's going on? Well, the surgeons are sending me pictures, I need to give you an opinion, the patients are, I look at their phone, and all these pictures are being flown around. I'm like, is this HIPAA compliant? She goes, shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> uh, um, so, to your question, I think we're in dark ages still, uh, um, in a way. I, I, Manish, you and I talked about in the green room earlier. There is a lot of room for innovation, obviously, especially in the infrastructure in our data centers. And again, going back to earlier conversations, we believe in the tech space, this is the biggest opportunity in the past three decades. With the cloud infrastructures, Internet of Things, and everything's coming together on commoditized hardware, with the software innovation in the Bay Area, we have a, such a huge opportunity taking that dark age into the uh, next generation, especially around security, so new storage technology, software-defined networking, and overall new container-based application development, bringing the cost down while getting a faster time to market, especially in healthcare. By the way, 50% of our business is in healthcare. Uh, uh, from Stanford to Kaiser to UC system, many hospitals are now working on this, cloudifying their systems, but there's still a long way to go. And that's the opportunity for our uh, uh, Bay Area, for the companies like us. That's great, thank you. Um, a question, actually, back to you, Tarkin. How do we better leverage data to drive us towards better value for medical spending and faster cure for diseases? And what do you see as the key steps that need to be taken by the healthcare industry? to realize value in the short term, not just the long term? So there are two aspects of that. Uh, just, again, to give context and reality behind that. There are applications and all the new application innovation uh, uh, from companies who are providing you know, electronic medical records that I know Manish works uh, you know, uh, deeply. But there's also infrastructure. Uh, we are an infrastructure company. We are the pipes behind that. But there is a lot of software innovation around that infrastructure to make that infrastructure secure. Uh, uh, manageable, available, reliable, uh, scalable, and most importantly, when you bring those letters into a mnemonic, uh, uh, you end up with smarts. Basically, uh, uh, um, intelligence and predictive modeling it becomes a huge, huge deal. Um, uh, we believe with the latest technology around Internet of Things, like the uh, sensor technology, uh, especially in our hospitals, being used and should be used as we move forward, like we're using in our cars and other systems, is going to be a big deal. Not only the healthcare delivery, but pr a a prevention of disease. Uh, we uh, have a, a big work going on with DHHS, uh, which is uh, 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 NIH is the leading agency, uh, uh, Na National Institute of Health. Uh, CDC works with them uh, uh, very carefully. We just did a project with uh, CDC around the Zika virus. This is becoming a, a big problem now. We thought it went away. The computational needs for this uh, uh, research is huge. Petabytes and petabytes data. Remember, big, this is big stuff. Would cost millions and millions of dollars for, for each time you're doing research. We talked about genomic research earlier. Yes. All that work requires a lot of computational and storage services, and we believe new cloud technology, new IoT technology, new software-defined storage, software-defined compute technology is going to help us to make that research very cost-effective. In the past, even a decade ago, a, a, a ago, we could not do this now. Now we can you know, apply that kind of a very fast research on, against very large data sets. So really, the, the, the advent of cloud computing is actually enabling the research that's probably 
been cost prohibitive previously to do to actually now become the norm just because of the computational needs and the price that we can actually... Absolutely. Uh, like universities we talked about earlier, uh, from Cambridge to Oxford, where you uh, uh, were born, uh, um, to, to uh, Berkeley, uh, um, uh, I think Michelle is here from Berkeley, to Stanford, to UC, UC system, to Carnegie Mellon. There's a lot of work going on among universities actually bring, uh, you know, bringing those compute and storage power into a shared environment to bring the cost down on the research. Not only research, but also delivery of, uh, of the healthcare. Uh, and obviously the public-private partnerships are important, from Bay Area Council to NIH to CDC to DHHS. We work with the universities together to deliver that research. Okay. Manish, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, re, uh, rephrase the question again. How do we better leverage data to drive us towards better value for medical spending and faster cure for diseases? Yeah. And what do you see as the key steps that need to be taken in the healthcare industry for the short term? So we are actually well on our way to realize cost benefits from implementation of big data practices. Let me illustrate it through a couple of examples. Uh, when, if you look at the months of March and July, typically mid-March to mid-July, we at Kaiser Permanente traditionally saw a huge spike in patients being admitted into the hospital with asthma attacks. One of the reasons for that is because, uh, because of the increase in pollen count. We've been able to take environmental data, patients' data, patients' uh, socioeconomic information, and combine it all together to derive insights and be able to warn the patient that you may be susceptible to asthma attack during this time of the day. You have that information today. We never had the ability to pull it all together and run very quick analytics on top of it. Today, our solutions, our big data solutions, allow us to do and derive the, those types of insights. Another example, we, every time we build a hospital, it's about $3 billion, right? So we are focused heavily on how do you continue to increase the throughput of your hospitals? How do you ensure that the same hospital is seeing more patients on a daily basis? And that's done by effective management of resources, effective management of nurses, effective management of pharmacists, effective ma management of doctors, the ICU beds themselves, and being able to reduce the length of stay for a patient, and thereby increasing the throughput of the hospital. So we are actually seeing the power of big data unleash at Kaiser Permanente, and not just in, in terms of innovation, but also in terms of cost savings. So it's really about accelerating healthcare and actually treating more patients. And you see the role of this computational paradigm shift as well as big data being critical to actually seeing more patients, which goes to this ubiquitous access. Absolutely. Big data combined with the power of cloud computing, combined with the power of software-defined everything, it, it, that is the future. Okay, that's great. So just a final question to both of you. Um, obviously, as I sort of framed up at the beginning, the, the importance of cloud computing plus big data and what it's enabling us to go do. There's also some societal concerns as well as, um, I would say, sort of pragmatic conversation around responsibility and use of data. The value of data is, is very little until you can extract insights, share it, and engage on it. Maybe you could just, with that sort of, with that sort of a, um, talking point, just provide us your perspective around um, thinking about privacy and protection of patient data and really ensuring the responsible use of this data in the cloud. Yeah, this is obviously a big concern. Um, I don't want to sound cliche here, but uh, in our country, in the United States, we uh, established HIPAA Act basically uh, to cover some of these issues, but it doesn't cover everything yet. As I gave the example earlier, don't tell my wife. Um, this is a big problem. Now, in addition to that, with the cloud computing, now the, uh, the next dimension of the problem is the governance. Who governs the data? Who owns the data, especially with the new type of cloud infrastructure that Kaiser is using or Stanford is using or any kind of a state hospital across uh, the borders, not only in our country but other countries as there's more research happening uh, between university hospitals uh, across boundaries. So it's not only the security and privacy and encryption of the data and the privacy of the, uh, 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 the patient, but it's also the governance of data, uh, especially with the cloud computer now, that every resource is shared, whether that's an application resource or infrastru infrastructure resource, uh, the underlying infrastructure. This becomes a, a problem that we believe 
that private sector has a role in it, but also uh, uh, we believe the uh, government has some role in it to set some standards with the private sector and also with the uh, educational community, with the universities. We see also a huge opportunity for investors, for VCs, for entrepreneurs to provide additional value there. And I believe in the next decade, uh, especially in healthcare, uh, we're going to see a lot of new startups coming out, basically tackling those three dimensions of that uh, issue, security, privacy, and the governance of the data. Okay, that's helpful. Mr. Manish. Yeah, um, so it's very interesting. Kaiser Permanente was among the first, and it's the largest electronic medical record system on this planet. Massive amounts of data. It's all stored in the central electronic medical record system. But I may ask you, who owns your medical record information? The answer is you. Kaiser does not own it. So we see the future as being something quite drastic, quite radical, in that you as a patient will decide where and when to store that data. You may decide to store it on your mobile device. You may decide that you would then be able to take that data and submit it to a research that you might be interested in. So we believe that the privacy and security is going to move to the edges, is going to move to the devices, it's going to be moving to IoT systems that today transmit a lot of this data. And we believe that uh, your electronic medical record system eventually will become a central hub, but the data itself will reside with you at, at your fingertips for your use in any way, shape, or form you use, choose, choose to use it. So you really see the evolution of it sort of being a centralized security model to pushing out that security to the end user? That's correct. Okay, that's very helpful. Well, gentlemen, we're slightly out of time. I sincerely appreciate you both taking it. Yeah. I think it's, hopefully this is an insightful conversation, not too deep technically around zettabytes, petabytes, and eurobytes uh, in terms of where we're going with big data, but you know, just in terms of the use cases that both Manish and, um, and Tarkin have talked about, hopefully you're beginning to see some of the opportunity that you can see by bringing these technologies into the healthcare space. Please uh, thank, thank Tarkin and thank Manish for their time. We appreciate it. <laughs>